Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just uh, looking down at the participants count and we're looking like we've got uh, well close to 120 people already in climbing. So I'm gonna just wait maybe a, a few more seconds to have uh, our folks come in uh, and be able to be part of this uh, campus conversation. So uh, really, really delighted to see uh, several individuals being able to carve out some time uh, during what is clearly a, a very, very challenging time for us. So, um, yep, we're, we're up to 260 odd people there. So um, I'm going to get going, uh, if that's okay, just because I know we have a, a wonderful group of panelists. And um, Daryl Peel is going to be moderating uh, this discussion. And uh, we'll have plenty of opportunity, I think, over the next 90 minutes to have conversations, discussions, and questions. So. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let me just begin by thanking all of you for um, taking part in this campus conversation. This is our first uh, summer uh, campus conversation. Summer is, of course, almost halfway over. But I again appreciate all of you taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank our uh, distinguished panelists. You'll hear from them in just a few minutes. And I want to thank our moderator as well, Daryl Peel, who's, of course, our newest member of the NKU team. And he is going to be moderating the panel. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Bonita Brown, our Chief Strategy Officer, for all the work that happens behind the scenes. And of course, uh, the IT folks that have now become experts uh, in, this, in this venture and being able to handle these types of webinars and, uh, and, uh, and town halls. So really happy that, um, that we're all uh, together and, and able to have this conversation. Uh, you know, we've used this um, term many times. We are in the midst of, um, I would say, an unprecedented set of crises. Uh, we began with a global pandemic, uh, something we haven't seen in 100 years. Um, quickly that followed up um, big, uh, as a result of the, um, the approaches that we had taken, very prudent, I might add, uh, with an economic crisis that we're of course dealing with. This economic crisis is probably the biggest ch uh, crisis we have seen since the Great Depression. And then you layer on top of that, the social crisis, given the systemic racism that continues um, in real and horrific ways. And uh, we have more than what we would call a perfect storm of crises. But during these challenging times, I think institutions of higher education have a very specific and important role. And that is to convene and facilitate discussions and dialogues around these complex issues so that we all have a better understanding of the challenges and possible solutions to, uh, to, these, uh, to these issues. And so um, I, it is very consistent with our core mission uh, of, of both discovery, transmission, application of knowledge, so that our understanding of these issues and we promote learning can be enhanced. Uh, so once again, I am so grateful for this panel that has taken some time out to be with us. Uh, I'm going to, without further ado, hand it over to Earl Peel to do the moderation. And I, for one, am looking forward to learning uh, as well from all these individuals. So thank you again for joining us. And Daryl, uh, off to you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored, pleased, and very proud to serve as moderator for today. Today, we are gathered here for the Campus Conversation Town Hall meeting. Um, the topic today is race, pandemic, and the power of education. And as we begin this conversation, I, I have to add just a few words. The President summed it up very well, but we, in Northern Kentucky University is a very welcoming community a community that is fueled by its desire to help learners navigate the path toward their educational goals. And student success is at the very core of everything we do at Northern Kentucky University. Each year, thousands of students come from across the Commonwealth, the region and around the world to grow and to thrive at Northern Kentucky University. However, as you all know, in recent months, the pandemic and race relations have really been the focus of all of America. And it has really impacted our ability to to, to serve our institution, serve our mission, and to serve our students. So today, we gather with a group of, of subject matter experts to talk about these, those very things and how it has changed our lives and what has become our new normal. Um, in, in recent weeks, we've had a couple of victories. The Supreme Court decisions to, to give rights and protection to LGBTQ community and for the legal status of DREAMers to not be nullified. And so while there's still a long road for, for the DREAM Act, we still have a much better place than we were a couple of weeks ago when we thought the legislation was going to be dismantled. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. 
Um, and the panel for this today is Mr. Andy Durarajay, Vice President for Undergraduate Academic Affairs, Karen Miller, Chair of Political Science, David Singleton, Professor of Law and Director of Constitutional Litigation Clinic, Amal Saeed, Associate Professor of Accounting and member of the Inclusive Excellence Council, and Valerie Hardcastle, Executive Director for the Institute of Health Innovation and Vice President for Health Innovation. So before we begin, I would like to let everybody who's watching know that we are recording today's um, program and will be made available to you um, to review and see again. And also too, right now, we're gonna take a pause just to do a quick poll. The poll will be so we can find out who is in fact watching and, and enjoying and engaging with us today. And it will be our way of being able to get a survey to you afterwards um, to help us figure out how we can continue to do these programs and make them better. And so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Benita Brown, Vice President Brown, who will um, navigate, help you navigate through the poll. All right, the poll should be visible to you now. Um, if you all could uh, complete that, we'll wait a few seconds for uh, you all to complete the poll. And again, we just wanna know what your affiliation is so we can, uh, again, determine and plan uh, future programs. All right, that looks like about everybody. All right, so I am going to end the polling at this point. Very, thank you very much for that. Um, and I will share the results. You can see. So it looks like the staff is our large majority. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Daryl. Thanks, Benita. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna, with no further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start our, our conversation with the panel. Um, our opening portion of this will be focused mainly on the pandemic. So at this time, I'd like to open up the questioning. And the first question is to the panel, how has the pandemic impacted the economy of Northern Kentucky? Hello, Daryl. Hey there. Hi, my name is Amal Said, and thank you for the introduction, Daryl. I'd like to start maybe with giving you a little bit of background about the, um, how the economy is affected by the pandemic. So there is more than 9.3 million people around the world uh, been infected with COVID-19, uh, 2.4 million in the US, and more than 481,000 people uh, have died, um, sadly, from the disease globally, uh, 124,000 in the US. Uh, in Kentucky, there is more than 14,000 infection cases um, have been reported and more than 500 deaths. So the pandemic has had far reaching consequences beyond the spread of the disease itself. Uh, so while it is um, very hard to exactly quantify the economic damage from the global uh, pandemic, there is a widespread agreement among economists that it will have severe and negative impacts on the global economy. Uh, the monetary impact has yet to be estimated, but more likely in the billions, uh, which is really, this is unprecedented economic conditions. Uh, to give you a glimpse of these effects, um, on February 24, the global stock markets fell due to a significant rise in the number of COVID-19 cases outside mainline, main, uh, mainland China. Uh, by February, um, 28, the stock markets worldwide saw their largest single week declines since the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, the global stock markets crashed in March with falls several percent in the world's major indices. Um, this is, as the president mentioned, this pandemic caused the largest global recession in history with more than a third of the global population at the time being placed on lockdown and as the pandemic spread, global conferences, events across technology, fashion, sports uh, were canceled uh, or postponed. So for example, looking at the US economy with the pandemic limiting movement, disrupting um, supply chain and economic activity, uh, retail sales dropped at around 8.7% in March. Uh, that is the largest month-to-month -month decrease in retail sales, I would say, at least since 1992. Um, unfortunately, our northern Kentucky region is not different, as our local economy is not developing vacuum. 
Uh, I want to share some data relevant to our region here, and I would like to give a shout out to Janet Herra, the director of C the Center for Economic Analysis and Development at the College of Business here at Florida Kentucky University uh, for providing some uh, very relevant data comparing before and after the pandemic, layoffs, rates of unemployment, and uh, some of the new unemployment claims. So to give you an idea, according to the 2020 estimates, there is around six to seven drop in real GDP in 2020 for the Cincinnati metropolitan statistical area. Uh, that's huge, it represents a loss of more than $8 billion. Uh, there was around almost 315,000 initial un unemployment claims in Cincinnati metropolitan statistical area uh, over the 13 weeks period through June 13. The percentage drops the drop in jobs in April was around 14.3% in Cincinnati metropolitan statistical area. That's compared to 13% uh, drop in job rate for the US. Um, the unemployment rate for April was around 14% in Cincinnati metrop metropolitan statistical area, uh, which, is also, which is close to the national rate for the US. Um, there has been economic disparities in minority groups. For example, women in business have been most vulnerable to the economic devastation caused by the corona pandemic. Uh, this is why some people call the COVID-19 economy as being the she session. Um, the research looked at the pandemic effects on US minority owned small business. I know, for example, that the Small Business Development Center at the College of Business in, at NKU has been assisting small business in the region. Um, Black Americans have higher rates of infection and death for coronavirus. Uh, they've been vulnerable even before the pandemic, and sadly, it has struck minorities and Black disproportionately hard. Um, so many Black Americans are in industries most predisposed to health and economic problems, such as accommodation, food, uh, service, retail, uh, health care. The unfair access to loans, among other factors, uh, contribute to the health and economic disparities in the Black community during the pandemic. And the reason has more to do with 400 years of history than biology and other factors. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, so, and, I'm, and panelists, I'd like to know from you as well, what role has politics played in how we have managed the pandemic? Well, I'm happy to jump in and, and swim in treacherous waters. Um, I'm David Singleton, and it's really a pleasure to be part of uh, this discussion. I am not a political scientist. I am a lawyer by training, um, but I'm civically engaged and I pay attention to politics. And the thing that is really distressing in, in my opinion about the time we live in is the hyper partisanship, the tribal nature of discussions around politics in our country. And just, and, and, and so many things are under assault as a result of that. Um, we can't agree on what is fact and what is not fact. Science is very much now something that is politicized. If you are, you know, in favor of science, you're in disfavor to, to some people. Um, and that's really problematic when it comes to how we should go about managing responses to the pandemic. I just saw last night what happened down in Palm Beach, Florida, where the local council there voted unanimously to require masks to be worn um, to prevent transmission of the virus. That is something that science says is effective. And the discussion devolved into accusations um, from people who were opposed to that. And it was, it, was, it, it was sort of a nice summary of how broken we are politically, where you have folks yelling at the council members and basically threatening to have them arrested by citizens because mask wearing has become politicized. Um, when you think about reopening economies around the country, 
that has been politicized with some folks saying it's better to open and and be robust economically when it's going to result in deaths. So I guess what I'm saying is I think that absolutely yes, it's politicized. It's the nature of 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 where we are right now. But if we don't find a way to come together across this political divide, what Professor Saeed was talking about in terms of the, 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 the recession that we're in is going to get worse. If we cannot work together across political lines to manage this outbreak, this pandemic, we're gonna to have to shut it all down again and that's gonna hurt us all. So we've got to bridge the, the political divide. And if I could follow up on that, because I think in, in some, I mean, I agree with everything that was said and I, I think David Singleton said it in a much politer way than I would articulate my opinions about what's going on uh, with uh, political interference with our management of the pandemic. But the other thing I think we need to keep in mind are unintended what I'm going to charitably call unintended consequences. And so let me just, and, and this is where it, to me, it really intersects with the conversations around race that we are having as a nation right now. So 41% of African American owned businesses were closed during the pandemic. And part of that has to do with the fact that um, most African American businesses are consumer facing. And obviously those are much more dangerous than if you are running, say, an IT company. Another issue is that um, African-Americans for a variety of historical reasons that we can talk about later do not have access to capital in the same way that white Americans do. So they simply don't have the cash to be able to front a pandemic in the way white Americans do. So 41% of African-American businesses were shut down 16% of white owned businesses were shut down. Now the government decided, and I'm glad they did, that we needed to provide loans to businesses to help them bridge the pandemic. Only 10% of African American businesses were able to access those loans. Why is that? Because part of the criteria for getting the loan is that you needed to have a pre-established relationship, a business relationship with a bank. But the African-American business owners, by and large, particularly the very small business owners, don't operate that way. And so I think an unattended consequence of being hasty in how we're managing providing help to people ends up not assisting the very people who need the most assistance. And to me, a lot of this has, again, to do with pol this politicization that David Singleton was talking about because we can't talk about these issues. And as a consequence, very important voices are being shut out of the conversation. Because if somebody there had just a little bit of awareness regarding who it is that actually has business accounts at banks, they would quickly realize that this policy, while intended to help small businesses, ended up not being able to help them, and in particular, differentially impacted the communities that already are differentially impacted by the pandemic. Thanks, Valerie. Um, I'm going to move to our next question. You know, as, as, as educators and here at Northern Kentucky University, all of you have um, had, I'm sure, multiple conversations with your students. And we would like to know, how has the pandemic impacted our students? There's issues around digital divide, multi-generational housing, unemployment, health concerns. What are you hearing from your students? What are the things and how has the M uh, pandemic impacted our students? So I would like to start with uh, maybe seeing, looking at the half full glass uh, and seeing that there is a little bit of positive things that I saw from my students. Uh, for example, the, the enhance, enhancing the students' flexibility and global awareness. Um, so uh, they're, you know, being exposed to this pandemic, um, the students uh, are aware now that we are one community, one virus that started thousands of miles away has affected each and every one of us and everyone around us in some shape or form. And um, this is the, in freedom's, you know, Friedman's uh, words, the word is flat. So it definitely 
Uh, this pandemic uh, showed the manifestation of the core idea of this book. It also, I saw a lot of flexibility uh, that increased for students and we, as we, uh, as they change the learning to adapt to their new learning environment, the delivery modes, uh, and in turn help them to be more, I think, more resilient. Uh, but definitely there was also a lot of um, negative or uh, effects from the uh, pandemic. And I saw that unfortunately, um, you know, during the spring semester, especially, um, the pand you know, there was a delayed uh, graduation for some students. Uh, there has been severe financial impact because of losing their jobs or losing job offers. Uh, the growth potentials and readiness to the job market has also been affected due to some of the cancellation and internships. Uh, cannot ignore the psychological effects due to illness or losing loved ones or social isolation. Um, the academic performance for some students affected too. So that means we as educators as and as a campus, we need to uh, know and be aware of the resources, including financial resource, resources, counseling resources to help our students and to think creatively to provide uh, experiential learning. Um, just to share with you on a recent study that uh, has, been, has been done by Arizona State University, it's just been recently published in Inside Higher Ed uh, just a couple of days ago. The main conclusion was that the pandemic hurt college students. What is interesting is that the same study found that, re uh, that these results vary depending on uh, the student's socioeconomic status and race. Uh, lower income students were 55% more likely to delay graduation than their higher income peers. Uh, COVID-19 also nearly doubled the gap between higher and lower income students expected GPAs. Um, racial minority students were 70% more likely to change their majors due to the pandemic and first generation students were 50% more likely to delay graduation. Looking here at NQU, when the pandemic started and we had to move online and change the mode of instruction, some students could not cope. And guess who? Minority, uh, particularly black students were affected the most. Um, although there were a lot of efforts from different colleges across campus and NQ to provide resources such as loaner laptops, hotspots, and other assistant programs, uh, financial ones such as Fuel and Q, there were still inequalities and disparities related to uh, digital divide, as I mentioned, multi generational housing, unemployment, lack of health care, lack of counseling, health concerns in general, uh, which means that more needs to be done systematically uh, to bridge uh, these gaps. And, and more alarming and concerning is the report surfacing that the recession is forcing more students, especially minorities, to leave. Uh, or forego college, which means that existing disparities uh, would, would, would worsen. Thank you, thank you. Um, sticking with the idea around the pandemic and education panel, I'd like to know how has the pandemic impacted higher education? You know, the way we teach, the way we deliver classes, the expectations of students, student support services, tuition, educational costs. There's a lot of issues in around higher ed. Um, we haven't heard from you, Karen, but I'd love to hear from you. Hi, uh, I think it's safe to say that the pandemic has impacted higher ed in every way imaginable. And we could break down every element that you mentioned. But if you imagine, uh, it, imagine if someone had told us a year ago that universities, these bastions of learning where people gather for every activity, where we experience this energy from youth and the idealism that comes from that would be closed and everyone will be working from home. I, I would not have believed that, and I don't know how many of us in higher ed would have thought we could have pulled it off, but we did. Um, going remote due to the pandemic caused us to re-examine everything that we do. We've learned that we can deliver content remotely, even content that we thought seemed impossible before. The pandemic has taught us that we can no longer function within the autumn in New England model, the leaves falling from the trees while the students are walking around and the professors have their blazers with the patches on the, the elbows. It just doesn't work anymore. It's not, not as much of the reality. Um, it's caused us to, to recognize that we have to change our approach. We have to evolve. Um, one thing that, that as um, uh, Professor Said was, was talking, I think about this generation of, of incoming students and 
And it's almost a gift if you consider this alternate view. We have, as a society, faulted this generation of students for being too focused on technology, too distant from one another. We've discouraged their reliance on text rather than voice, their social media rather than face-to-face. -face. And now they're forced into a model of higher education that they, better than any generation before them, are equipped to handle. So I think um, we can find a, a bright side as we move forward in this, um, this new realm, if you will. Thank you, thank you. As, as we think about higher education and, and where we go from here, what is the role of higher education and, in, can you, and in K, <laughs> NKU um, in, this new, in this new world situation that we're in? And how, do we go, how are we going to help our students and community and region through the pandemic? Um, love to hear from Andy. Andy, we, we haven't heard from you. Thanks, Daryl. You know, as, as we think about what the role of higher education is and what we need to be thinking about going forward, I, I go back to the idea of being a student-ready institution. And so we've been talking about how we are ready to take on our students no matter what their circumstances are or what they're going through or, or where they're coming from. And I think the pandemic just adds an additional layer to it. You know, when you think of our role and what we need to do, we need to be educating our students. We need to be educating our region. We need to be educating the nation. And we're gonna have to find more effective ways to do that, to, to access, uh, to connect, um, and also to, to open opportunities. And so as Karen mentioned before, you know, our faculty were amazing and how nimble they were to be able to transition to online. And, and we're really excited about how we did that. And, and this summer we're training so we can be even better at it if it happens again, which is highly likely. But I think we've got to make sure we think about it. at this time when we're being impacted on so many different fronts from an economic standpoint, uh, from a social standpoint, uh, from a health standpoint, we've also got to bring another level of empathy that I think oftentimes gets lost in our conversations with our students. Right now, uh, you know, gone is the narrative that these students haven't dealt with anything, that they haven't, you know, had uh, the hard life that many past generations have. You know, these students are coming to us in a space where they didn't even experience the end of their senior year. You know, they're coming from where people are dying at an alarming rate. And so they're bringing a lot of emotional baggage that's gonna impact a lot of the outcomes. You know, we start thinking about student success and it's, you know, go to class versus take care of a sick parent or, you know, worry about my own health. You know, these are things that our students have to take into account. And so as we think about the role of higher education, our goal is still to educate learners, but I think we have to think about how we do it. Um, we have to be nimble in how we do it and innovative. But also, I think we have to have another layer of empathy, recognizing that the individuals that we are dealing with are impacted uh, by things that, you know, didn't exist when many of us were going through our higher education journey. Absolutely. Uh, may, I, may, may I respond to Andy? Most certainly. Okay. Um, if you consider the impact the pandemic is having on minority students, their path to an occupation that pays a living wage has been severely compromised. The early data indicates that they're being adversely impacted. So if universities are forward thinking and we look towards different models of skill-based education, we can help these students who are adversely impacted. We can provide them with a path toward gainful employment, toward great, um, Comp, you know, careers that are uh, rewarding. And so we have to, as Andy says, think about meeting stud students where they are, but we can't just focus on the liberal arts model. We have to expand that. Absolutely. Valerie? Yes, and to um, build further on what was just said, I think NKU, given that it is, it is a regionally engaged institution and prides itself on being that, we need to recognize that we have an additional responsibility to help lift our economy back up. So Amal gave great examples of the challenges that are, uh, we're facing on all fronts in our economy. And the truth is um, that a significant portion of businesses in the Northern Kentucky Cincinnati region have closed. And we as an educational institution that will be here on the other side of the pandemic need to figure out ways, new methods, new training programs, new collaborations that really can help reboot our economy because the faster we can get it running again, the more jobs will be available for our students, the more families will be able to afford to feed their children and so forth. And I think NKU can play an extremely important role in helping our region reboot. Thank you, Valerie. So ladies and gentlemen, as we talked said earlier when we opened, um, our topics today is the pandemic and race relations as well. And so we're gonna shift our questions to talk about some of the, the race relations and issues and challenges that we're facing in America. 
Our first question is, how did we get here? The history of racial inequity in policing has, is, is a long and sorted um, story. And so we can't deny, we have to also look at how has this been part of our historical experience um, here in the United States and how has things changed very much? So our question for the group and again is, how do we get here? How is, is, are, is history just repeating itself or, um, or is this new? I would tend to say that it's not. I think what's new is we have cameras on phones and things are being recorded. But I'll, I'll start that question. And I'll throw that out to Karen first. Um, the primary focus of American law enforcement has always been on the protection of private property. In the North, law enforcement finds its roots in things like night watches, railroad police, coal, coal police. Basically, they were protecting commerce. Um, in the South, law enforcement finds its roots in slave patrols. Southern cities with large slave populations formed police arrangements to deter black uprisings, to appease property owners or slave masters. At one time, all Southern states had slave patrol legislation. They varied in content. There, there were some similarities like rounding up of suspected runaway slaves, preventing uprisings. Um, one common thing, ironically, was that they had full power to enter into any dwelling where they thought there was evidence of a slave uprising. In other words, a no-knock search that we, we we know is present today in law enforcement. Um, it, but that's not the only way that police history has led us to where we are. Racism has been codified into law in many ways and therefore police practices. Black codes, drug war, capital punishment, Jim Crow, etc. Um, all throughout our history as a nation, uh, police have been used to oppress black people. Um, and uh, American, white Americans have accepted that reality. So if you follow the patterns of police practices through history, our current situation is almost an obvious destination. There was all, almost no avoiding it if you followed that path. Thanks, Karen. Anyone else would like to, to speak to this? I would like to jump in if I could. Um, I, I want to give the viewers um, a very sobering statistic that plays off of what we just heard from, from Karen. In the United States, we lock up 2.4 million people in prisons and jails. We lead the world in incarceration. We're 5% of the world's population in the United States and yet 25% of the incarcerated population in the world. And who is disproportionately impacted by that? It's black and brown people. If you are black, if you are a black man in this country, um, one out of three one out of three of us will spend some time in prison at some point in our lives compared to one out of um, 17 white um, men. That should not be, but it is. And you know, there'll, there'll be some people who will say, well, isn't that because black people commit more crime? Well, if you look at drug crimes, black and white people people commit drug crimes at the same rate. And yet, historically, and it's true today, if you are black, you are far more likely to be arrested, um, put into prison or jail, and have your life wrecked. Because the wrecking doesn't just stop with the conviction it's all those other things that come with a conviction, like not being able to have a job because you're disqualified based on a criminal record. So historically, this has been something that has grown out of the disproportionate use of police power against black people in this country. Daryl, if I could just jump in, I know everybody wants to get in on this one, but you know, another thing I would add as we move just away from policing, but to overall American society, I mean, when you look at everything we have at our institutions, they're built off racial inequities. You know, we work in higher education and we built institutions, historically black colleges for the slight exact purpose to keep African-Americans, black people away from white people in higher education. And so if you think about higher education as the number one driver of access and, you know, educational attainment and social mobility, 
And we didn't even want groups to be together to go through that. And so when you think about that as a baseline, that we're always thinking about how we divide, how we keep individuals apart, you look at where we are currently now and it's not surprising at all. You know, as we think about the protests and riots and, you know, having conversations with a lot of individuals, one of the big takeaways, uh, you know, people say, well, we can't believe people are so mad or, or people are so upset and we're seeing these riots. And, and the thing that kind of shocks a lot of black folks, and I'm going to be quite frank because I think we want to be honest on the fact is this is not new to anyone. This is not new to anybody. George Floyd was a tragedy, but we could name off 50 people right now that have been killed by police that we know. Um, and so, again, when you think about it from that standpoint, I, you know, I look at it having my other lawyer on the panel, we look at the but for cause of what's going on. You know, we weren't rioting a week before George Floyd was killed. And so let's not let the riots and the response, you know, drown out what the root issue is. And the root issue is that these inequities are leading to these outcomes, whether it be policing, whether it be in education, whether it be from health and social standpoint. But black people are just not treated fairly in this country. And I think that is the impetus for a lot of the things that you're seeing going on. Thanks, Andy. Karen gave us um, a, a great historical backdrop on the history of, of policing and its relationship with um, more specifically African-American communities. So my next question is, how do we see that previous history present in modern contemporary policing? Um, it's, it's not just in policing, though it is. It permeates every aspect of policing, but all of criminal justice, all of the political process. Um, if you just look at the societal or political level, it, it, it is um, what behaviors are considered criminal? What do we criminalize? And if you want to arrest a lot of people, make behaviors that people want to engage in criminal. So, um, drug activity, prostitution, things of that nature, loitering for, you know, if you want to arrest a lot of people in a community, make loitering illegal. And then it's selective enforcement beyond that. Where do you arrest people for loitering? Is it um, the middle class white kids hanging out at the mall? No, it's the, um, in the inner city neighborhoods, the ones where white America accepts us bad neighborhoods where we just all hook, line, and sinker believe that they're just permeated with crime. And when when you can convince the, the majority that, that that's the case, these things like, um, selective enforcement, the use of force, deadly force, no-knock searches, all of that becomes um, a necessary policing tool in the eyes of a majority of Americans. And until we can break that down and, and get people to see that, you know, we're talking about individuals who are dead, dead forever because of a broken taillight or uh, I got drunk and, and made the ridiculous decision to drive home. That's horrible. None of us want to condone drunk driving, but that's not a death penalty offense. And the, it, it also just defies the whole notion of justice that police are the, the police, the courts, the, the sentencers and, and the corrections that carry out the, the execution. I mean, the whole justice system is um, demeaned when we have these cases. Thanks, Karen. Could I actually um, add a point here? And, and it's, it's, it's how uh, policing has looked in the pandemic. And I'm gonna talk just about across the river in, in Cincinnati, because that's where um, I also practice law and you know, I've been an observer of what's going on here. And when you wanna talk about disproportionate policing, Let's look at who got arrested in Hamilton County. Hamilton County, for those of you who don't know, is where Cincinnati is. Let's talk about who got arrested for violating the state's stay-at-home order. First of all, there were 111 arrest, arrests in Hamilton County for violating the order. And oddly, in New York City, just 125 arrests for their similar law, which is just weird. We are a lot smaller than New York City. But put that aside. Black people make up 27% of the population of Hamilton County, Ohio, and yet 68% of the arrest for violating the stay at home order. Now you don't tell me that that's because um, only black folks were out walking around when they shouldn't have been walking around, stay, you know, no, that's not true. We can all, you know, those of us on this side of the river can all talk about how we saw white folks 
who were wondering what are they doing? They don't look like they're you know essentially out for whatever reason, and yet they're not getting arrested. Why is that? Why is that? There were black people who were the victims of violent crime um, uh, during times when the stay in order home order was in effect, and they got arrested um, and cited for violating the stay at home order, and they've been shot and they're out in the street. That is craziness. And so if anybody is sitting here thinking that policing is unbiased, that shows you um, that it is not. And it is very biased in a troubling, deeply troubling way. Thanks, David. So, so ladies and gentlemen, as, as we move down the, the, the road um, and, and, and start to deal with systemic racism, um, as an institution, as a nation, and as a state, um, how do we move from protest to action, equity, and fairness? How do we move from protest to action, equity, and fairness? So, so I'll jump in, uh, Daryl. You know, I think for us to move from protest to action, we've got to take a couple steps. I think first we've got to, you know, have an awareness that there is an issue. And I think that's part of the protest. We recognize that there are challenges. But I think on an individual level, the next thing we need to do is really assess ourselves. What are our biases? Because we all play a part in this. You know, David just mentioned it, but generally our biases is what lead to the outcomes we're seeing. And so going in and saying, what are my biases against certain populations and how is it negatively impacting those populations? And then once we've been able to, you know, actually identify there's a problem, assess what our bias is, then we need to go and look at what are the barriers we put in, you know, intentionally, unintentionally that are negatively impacting these populations. You know, you think in the context of higher education. And so, you know, you look at us as NKU and we are a regionally engaged institution, as we mentioned before, but Cincinnati is part of our region. And so, you know, that's one of the things we have to think about. Um, you know, you look at our, our demographics on campus of our students and we don't see that in our staff and our faculty. And that's something we need to say to ourselves, why is that the case? Why is it the fact that our student of color can go through and matriculate at NKU and never interact with a staff member of color, whether that be an academic advisor or, or someone in the faculty as well? And so, you know, we've got to look at what are the things that we put in place that negatively impact, you know, these groups. And then the next step is we've got to come up with tangible ideas that will solve these problems. You know, we hear a lot about conversations and statements around diversity and inclusion, and those things are great. But statements without action are going to be hollow. You know, across the higher education landscape, every single president put out a statement about why diversity inclusion matters and, you know, they're uh, standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. But if you go back to your campus and you don't do anything different, you go back to your community and you don't do any different, you go back to your social circle and you don't do anything different, then really you're just paying lip service. And we can have conversations to we're blue in the face, but if folks aren't ready to go back and have tangible outcomes they're looking for and actually hold each other accountable, uh, we're not really going to see the change that we hope to see. And I think too, um, talking, building off what Andy said, is that we really need to um, take both a systemic view, as he was articulating, but also a very particular view, and make sure we think everything through. And that is, we need to pay attention between the distinction between policy, procedure, and process. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we could have our policies correct, but our procedures and process are messed up, and so we don't get the outcomes they want. I'll just give you a very quick example, which I am pulling out of a hat, so I'm not claiming it applies to NKU at all. But many institutions want to increase the number of students of color on their campus, a laudable goal. However, their admissions requirement require the SAT or ACT score, and they use that as a benchmark for whether you are admissible to campus. But anyone who studies anything about higher education quickly recognizes the ACT and SAT scores tell you absolutely nothing about the potential for student success. We know what gives you what is most correlated with student success. It's high school GPA. So let's say you recognize this and you realize, well, we should not be requiring at all ACT and SAT scores. So we want to do something else. We're going to move to holistic admissions. Holistic admissions means you look at the entire student without particular regard for, you know, some bar like you have to have this SAT score or ACT score. So we're a regionally engaged institution. Maybe we want to care about whether students are regionally engaged. Are they interacting with their community in particular ways? 
That seems like a good criteria to have, a good procedure to put in place to replace our policy about ACT scores. But then those students who come from low income areas, in many cases, students of color, may not have that sort of experience because they have to go to work when they're 15 or 16 and help support their family. And so they don't get to do the after school stuff or volunteer in the community or anything else. And so you have to think through not only changing in your policy, but also the procedure behind it. And then finally, you have to look at how things are implemented. Um, and and I'll, give you, I'll give you a case from my own history, uh, just so it's, it's only my embarrassment, no one else's. Um, and of course, this doesn't deal with being African American, but deals with being a woman. And so when I first went to, when I was first hired, of course, I was, I was one of two women in my department. I went to, got my PhD on a minority scholarship. I mean, that, that's how bad it was back then. Um, but faculty meetings were scheduled from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. My daycare closed at five o'clock. So I had to leave every day by five o'clock, before five o'clock to pick up my kids. Now the thought was that if you bring a woman onto the faculty, things would start to change. But the reality was I was intimidated into speaking up and saying, wait a minute, I can't actually participate in your community because I have to go get my kids. Um, and I was worried about the perception that they would then see me like, well, now I don't belong because they don't have that problem. They have their kids taken care of, but I don't. And so I'm not as serious as they are in wanting to participate in their community. Now, of course, I could have spoken up and of course, now today I would have spoken up and explained the issue in probably a better way than I could have when I was 27. But the point remains that a lot of times we have all of these cascading unintended consequences, even when we're trying to do the right thing or we're just trying to live our lives. And we have to recognize that if we want to change as an institution, we're gonna to have to rethink things through top to bottom. And we're gonna to have to listen more carefully to voices that might be afraid to speak up because they already feel like they don't belong. Thanks, Valerie. Daryl, do you mind if I just jump in on one point? No, I'll absolutely. be very brief. Um, in terms of like reform or, or changing, transforming the criminal legal system, I wanna say one thing about what needs to be also done vote. Please vote. Um, I'm saying that particularly to young people, um, many of whom I'm hearing are just tuning out of the electoral process because they don't think it's going to get anything accomplished. Please vote. If you care about disproportionate um, prosecutions uh, based on race, vote. Vote, in, vote not just for, for who the president is, vote in your state and local elections where most of criminal legal system policy is made. Vote in the prosecutor's race, vote for who uh, the judges are, because that stuff can make a difference. And particularly if we organize enough and, 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 and vote in blocks, we can get some things positive to happen. So vote. Thanks, I would add very quickly, I, uh, I definitely agree with you, um, David. And, and I think going back to your question, Daryl, uh, how to move from pro protest to action. I think protest itself is a kind of action. So uh, I think it's more how to systematically uh, create change. And part of the change also is, is part of the, is, is being active and voting. And, uh, and I think there is a bigger role for education that we definitely gonna talk about. Yeah, and also just to on what David said, it's so important. Those local elections are in some ways more important than 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 the national and regional. The um, local criminal justice officials, the prosecutor, when they're elected officials, they get really tough on crime during those election cycles, and they make decisions and they prosecute people on on things that um, are sometimes suspect. They become overzealous. Um, the police mission and mandate can be changed at the local level and and it starts with voting for those, those local politicians and so um, if, in terms of creating change education is key but so too is voice and and since we're talking about voting and voice I will also make the obvious connection that our entire system of criminal justice which has disproportionately taken a voice away from a segment of the population has um, uh, really silenced 
African Americans in, in our history, especially since the Civil Rights Movement, when they uh, really fought for the vote and we had the war on drugs, et cetera. And one of the outcomes um, was silencing that voice or, or quieting that voice. Absolutely. So I would like to remind the audience that if they would like to submit questions, they can, because um, after we finish our last question, we will be entertaining um, questions from our, from our audience. So please, if you have questions, please submit them. Um, our next question is about what is the role of higher education um, as we move and, and navigate through our, 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 our challenges with racial inequities and, 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 and other social ills? What is the role of education? And so I, I would like to also not just limit it to higher education as in universities, but even K-12. What is, what is the role of education? You're all educators, love to hear from you. So I would, you know, Daryl, I would jump in and say, you know, the role of education is educating students. And so as we think about where we currently are as a society, I think our role has never been more important because one of the things that's leading to a lot of the outcomes we see is a lack of education. Individuals aren't aware. You know, as a higher education institution, we talk about creating these informed citizens who go out and do things like vote and, and lead the social change that we know needs to happen. And so as educators, we need to take advantage of that. You know, one of the concerns that I have is oftentimes we look at what we're teaching in the classroom or what's outside of the classroom, and we don't bridge the two, but we definitely need to bridge the two of what we're doing. Uh, I was talking to a group of students, and one of the students said to me, you know, why don't we have mandatory courses on Black history? And so I asked the student, I said, did you take, you know, History 102 and History 103, American History? And they said, yes, we took both of those courses. And I said, History 102, American History, that is Black history. And if we're not covering Black history within those courses, then we're doing our students a disservice because the history of Black people is part of the history of this country. You know, the other thing that I think we've got to think about is we've got to be the leaders of the change for our region. Being a regionally engaged institution, the surrounding community is looking for us to take the lead on things. They're looking for us to model the behavior we'd like to see going forward. You know, oftentimes myself and many of our other colleagues across campus get asked to go out and talk to groups. So one of the questions they ask is, you know, how do we show that Northern Kentucky is a welcoming place? How do we include diversity and inclusion? How do we show that we are committed to, you know, eliminating racial inequities? And so again, if we can think about how we eliminate those things on our campus and model that behavior, I think that's an example of being a regionally engaged institution. And that shows that our role within the community, within the region, within the nation and, and the country uh, is extremely important. And what are you want things that lead the change that we'd like to see? Thanks, Andy. I, yeah, I, com I completely agree with Andy. Definitely these are um, challenging times. There is a lot of injustice, anger, uh, pain, but it comes with greater opportunities to make change, especially as educators. Uh, and as an educational institution, we have the potential to provide transformational experience to our students, uh, but also to the Northern Kentucky community in general. So I, I joined NQ, I'm new to NQ, I've just joined in, in August, uh, but I've been involved with inclusion and diversity efforts and initiatives for 16 years at my prior university, uh, serving as faculty advisor for minority students and being president's counsel diversity for so many years. Um, I've been fortunate just in the last few months to, to join uh, part of the efforts at NQU, the Inclusive Excellence Council, uh, where we uh, are looking at uh, and using the Success by Design strategic framework to identify uh, the university's focus on student success, how to align it with the region as our roadmap map to empower the future of students and enhance the uh, economic, social, and civic uh, strength of our region. And as a team, we've been working on tying these different pillars. How can we recruit and access, uh, give access to minority students and diverse students? How can we uh, improve their completion and career, uh, community engagement? Um, I know there is a lot of uh, institute, you know, offices and organizations and on campus that provide an array of initiatives and provide resources for Minorities, Center for Student Inclusiveness, Office of Latino Programs and Services, African American Student Initiatives, LBGTQ programs. All of these are, are good, but it, the question is, is it enough? Uh, and probably not, probably we need to do more. We, I think we have a great opportunity to make changes as educators and as a higher ed institution, we need to be more engaged and have more in, in engaging and empowering not only students, but also faculty and staff, especially minority 
um, more cultural tra tra training. I know there is things happening, but definitely we need to do more uh, so that students of, of color and minority would feel comfortable uh, having more communication channels and dialogues. Uh, this is a good start today. I'm sure there's going to be much more. Uh, how can we help students, uh, you know, our colleagues and ourselves recognize uh, our own biases and sometimes toxic traits? Um, we need conversation about recognizing that Black lives matter for all lives to matter. Um, we need to make sure that every student, staff, and faculty member feels welcome to have a sense of belonging and appreciate appreciation for what they bring to the table. Um, so we, uh, we've been working the last few months as, as a, in the college and the university to be prepared for the fall in terms of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And I think we need to intentionally put more effort in, in preparing uh, our faculty and staffs for possible intimidation, microaggressions in the classroom, in the dining halls. Uh, we need to sometimes wear different hats and serve as buffers and advocates. And I think as educators, we need to be proactive and start moving change forward. Um, I've been looking, for example, at course material, how to promote conversation about diversity. You provided a very good uh, perspective here, Andy. Um, for example, and I think I know there's a lot of resources. Maybe we need to start, you know, sharing some of those resources. The Harvard Business Review, for example, provides a list of cases and articles about leadership and inclusion, um, and, and and how it, it focuses and features characters from historically un underrepresented groups, women, and leadership around the world. Cases on black CEOs and business owners. Uh, those are, are all important so we can uh, tackle diversity through our uh, and build it into our curriculum, curriculum in, in the classroom. Um, I think it's very important to be prepared, as I mentioned, and to just roll our sleeve and start discussing and addressing these racial injustices. Uh, we need some of the things I've been he hearing, you know, from our younger generation, our Gen Z is we need to make sure that there is accountability. Um, you know, how are we going to react to racist, uh, you know, comments, having consequences for aggressions and, you know, and um, making change, changing maybe some requirements for faculty and students on black history and diversity, as Andy mentioned. Um, so in general, I think we have a great opportunity. We need to, to address it. And uh, we need to involve it, to be prepared culturally, religiously, and generationally open and, and, and keep that in mind so we can provide a safe environment in the classroom and, and, and in the, the university. Thank you, Amal. So ladies and gentlemen of the panel, this is our last um, question that, that we, have, we have planned before we open it up to the questions um, from our audience. And so the last question is, how do we think racism and the pandemic combined will impact our campus this fall. The combination of race relations and the pandemic, how do you think it will impact our campus when we return in the fall? So I'll start off by saying that is a very, very loaded question. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I think it's gonna impact it a number of different ways. You know, again, we're dealing with the pandemic, and so we're gonna have a new group of, of, of first-time students, but also returning students whose lives have been impacted uh, from an economic standpoint. Um, you know, jobs have been impacted. Health outcomes have been impacted. And so we've gotta recognize that. And then when we think about our racial inequities, you know, we've got groups of students that are on campus um, that are not gonna accept the status quo around race relations as we have in the past, and rightfully so. And so I think as an institution, we've got to make sure we're able to respond to that, like Valerie said, through our policies, through our practices, but also, you know, through facilitating conversations. Because again, I think these things are going to come up in a lot of different places. They're going to come up in the classroom. They're going to come up in our residence halls. They're going to come up, you know, in our student affairs center and the rec center. And I think we all have a duty and a moral obligation to be prepared to, to, to engage in these conversations, to facilitate those conversations. So I think that, you know, we're gonna wear one more hat in the fall, um, but I think we all gotta be prepared for it because again, we've gotta be able to serve our students uh, how they're coming to us. Anyone else from the panel? I would add, you know, 
I, I was re just reading recently a very nice article by uh, Stephanie Creary from, um, she teaches diversity at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business and her advice to educators, so we were preparing ourselves to conversations about race in universities. So she calls it race. Um, so R, recognize that conversation about race can create anxiety, but you know what? We can reduce anxiety by just talking about race. And then the A accept that race, including my race and your race, will either be hyper visible or invisible. And then the C call on internal and external allies for help. We need we need we need to have uh, you know support to be able to address those things. And then the E expect that you will need to provide some answers, practical tools, uh, scale based framework to help students move from focusing on the problems to hopefully creating solutions and changing behavior. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we will turn it over to Benita, who will bring us the questions from the audience. Benita? Absolutely. We have several questions that have come in. So bear with me as I try to read those and pull those together. Uh, the first one wants to go back to the topic of the police um, and the question of defunding the police. Is that the solution to the problems that we're seeing today? What are the panel's thoughts on that? Well, I think some of oh. it is... Go ahead, Valerie. Uh, it's going to depend on what's meant by defunding the police. And I know that, you know, back to the original conversation, this is something that's now become hugely politicized, and I'm not sure people can have a rational conversation about it right now. So I'm going to change the, the approach just a little bit. Uh, funding, defunding, I don't know. But what we do need to have is a different type of policing. And that is we need to recognize that the vast majority of calls that police go to are not dealing with violence. They're dealing with problems of human misery and substance abuse and mental illness. And so we need to have people responding to those calls who are actually trained to deal with human misery substance abuse, and mental illness. And most police are not trained. They are trained to deal with violence. So whether that comes down to, well, we need two different groups of people, we need to have a differently trained force, we need some hybrid model, I don't know. But in my opinion, that's what needs to happen, is we need to recognize the sorts of calls our first responders get and make sure the people who are responding are able to respond to the human need. David? David? Yeah. I... Uh, you're on mute. Valerie said much better uh, what I was going to say. Um, I agree with everything she just said. Um, I, um, I also would say this. There, there are people who would say that, that we shouldn't bother with doing any kind of, you know, what we call reform of the system um, in terms of you know, how police officers use force and what their training um, is and the like. I would say that while I a thousand percent agree that we need to reimagine what policing looks like and um, uh, think about ways to do exactly what Valerie uh, indicated, which is to shift resources um, to folks who can uh, address issues that don't require a police officer. Um, I also think that in the short term, it's important to make sure that we don't have police officers in the streets right now killing people um, because they're using force that they shouldn't be using um, or that they are um, uh, doing other sorts of things that exacerbate the, um, uh, the disproportionate bringing of black and brown people into the system. So I think we need both. I think we need to be thinking big and also at the same time engaging in some sorts of efforts to make uh, to, 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 to make the system uh, w work better for people who are trapped up in it now. And I, I think something that underlies this conversation is Every time we talk about the police mandate and we talk about the police mission and what we can do to reform policing, we assume that policing is necessary. We assume that this militarized institution to designed to control and enforce the law is necessary. And 
it may not be necessary in the form that it takes. Uh, I think that what Valerie was mentioning was more of a service model. Americans um, are not as criminogenic as the media and other sources would have us to believe. So it, it could be that we could just reevaluate the entire institution and come out of it much better off. Thank you. The next question, um, there were a couple of questions from faculty members on, uh, they were intrigued about the um, diversifying and uh, making their curriculum more diverse. Do you all have any suggestions or recommendations, tips, strategies for how they can just make their curriculum and their syllabuses, their classroom, just a more diverse um, environment? So I, I saw one of the questions and I would start off by saying, you know, there's a lot of training out there and this is something that, you know, Daryl has on agenda. So I'll, I'll put that plug in now of, of inclusive classrooms. How do we promote inclusion within our classrooms? And so um, I would say that, you know, this fall in the spring and going forward, we're going to make a conscious effort to make sure that we can provide training around these issues. You know, we offered a cultural competency training through Norse Advising previously. And one of the things we've been in talked about how we can expand that to more groups because one of the issues of start thinking about how we can be more inclusive is being culturally competent is understanding the different potential groups we're going to be engaging with and you know how we engage them you know one thing i want to emphasize and, and i think it's really important we think about you know specifically african americans that, that blacks are not a monolithic group and so one of the challenges i think we oftentimes see is that we start thinking cultural competency and we think well if i've dealt with one of this group then i can deal with any and so uh one of my I'll say pet peeves is when we try to lump in person of color to include everyone who is non-white. And so I think that could be a starter because, you know, the lived experience of an African-American in the United States is going to be very, very different than someone who may be coming from a different ethnic background. And so, you know, taking that into account as we think that we're interacting with our students as all individuals. You know, we start talking about specifically out the curriculum, you know, this needs to happen at the department level. But I would say that we really need to take a hard look about what we're teaching. You know, I use the example of American history, but if we aren't touching on black history and American history, are we really teaching American history? And if we are really are teaching American history, are we really teaching true and accurate American history? And I think, you know, as we look at many of our courses, we can find ways to be more inclusive uh, and, and more inclusive in our content. You know, we have a section within our gen ed uh, curriculum around cultural pluralism, but I don't like the feeling that we think that those three credit hours should be enough to ensure that all of our students are exposed to diversity, inclusion, um, and, and issues that relate to, to, to populations of color. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do, and uh, we will be rolling out training to help, help faculty in those situations become more inclusive within their classrooms. As an instructor, I, I can say that just be intentional about it really take a look at your materials for each class and explore them, examine them critically. And are you being biased in your perspective? Example, I teach, or I used to teach a class on sociological theory, classical theory. So that means what a bunch of um, old white males thought about the way society functioned. And when I really critically looked at my syllabus for this course, I realized there was no feminist voice, there was no um, person of color voice, no black history voice, none of that was, was in that traditional teaching of that class. And so I stepped back, I made the changes, and I think that that's one of the things we can do. Um, we have to educate ourselves because as Andy was talking about with the students at Northern, I too went through my undergraduate education at a major regional institution and had one African-American history professor, and that was it. So that, that voice is very important, and when um, when it, the, the sources of that, that voice are limited, it falls on us. It's our obligation and our duty to make sure that we bring that to our students. If I may add also, you know, as an as a, as educator, I think it's very important. And I've been looking at, as I'm preparing my syllabus for the fall, I'm looking for material that, that they can enhance the diversity through even the cases I'm teaching or the, some of the assignments, even changing the names of, you know, the assi you know in, the, in the assignment or in the case or in the exercises that we're doing to make sure that we are as diverse as possible. One another aspect I've been thinking about is uh, how we form the groups and the group activities and the, the teamwork that we're doing in the classroom. We, 
Um, how can we educate ourselves as, as Karen and Andy mentioned? So we are prepared to educate our, our students in the classroom and have, especially the group work, uh, you know, much, not only much enjoyable, but um, a learning moment for everyone to, to be more inclusive. Thank you all. Um, the next question is about uh, protest and free speech. Um, how is the campus or what is the campus responsibility and role and how will they manage free speech and the right to protest on the campus this fall? And I think I'm going to direct that one at Andy. Thanks, Benita. Um, um, you know, one of the things that we have to balance as a campus is we are, you know, we focus on diversity and we're committed to diversity and inclusion, but we also are committed to the First Amendment and the ability for individuals to, to speak freely and provide their opinion. So one of the difficult things that we deal with is that there is a lot of speech and a lot of language that we don't like. And so because of that, um, we've got to be a place that can be open to all different forms of speech. We've got to be a place that when individuals say things that we don't like or counter to our beliefs, we have the opportunity to respond to them. Because in a democratic society, in a society that supports free speech, all individuals have a voice. Um, you know, as we think about speech that we think borders on discrimination, harassment, or rise to that level, Daryl's working on protocols in place so that we can respond as a university when we get to that point. But I want to emphasize for our, our campus community that the vast majority of speech out there is protected speech. And the way we combat speech we don't like is more speech. And so when you hear things that you don't like, that don't, aren't consistent with your values, I think you need to call it out. And I think you need to have, you know, exercise your voice as well to let individuals know that whatever they're saying is not consistent with the values of the university uh, and we don't support. And I think if we as a community can come together and, and, and be vocal and vigilant uh, in how we use our speech, I think we can see some change in some of the ideas and, and things that we see going on on our campus, but also around our campus in the region and in the community. Great, thank you. Um, the next question uh, probably can relate to the pandemic and to racism. What tips and strategies do you have for having the conversations with people who believe, for example, that systematic racism doesn't exist or that the pandemic is not real and is not having the impacts that we are seeing? seeing? Do you all have any tips and strategies for how you engage in some of those conversations? I, I realize that this may be um, uh, a, a statement that others will disagree with and that's fine. Because you know, I think there's some people who would say, don't waste your time having conversations with folks who, who are gonna do nothing but upset you. Um, I think that there is value to communicating with people you disagree with. For if no other reason, even though you disagree, you get to see a glimpse of their humanity. Because um, I think that, that everybody's got humanity. And I think part of the reason why we're so broken um, and uh, politicized is because we're losing sight of the humanity in others. So I think you have to lean in and have a conversation where, you know, it's not an argument, but a conversation. Why do you feel that way? Um, you know, if you disagree with someone, to, you know, tell me, tell me what's leading you to feel like, you know, wearing masks are some form of oppression. Um, and if you can have a genuinely open conversation, you may not leave that, con that discussion feeling like you've bridged the divide. You may not um, get that other person to agree with you. You may never agree with them. But I think that, that that it does some good in terms of, of at least um, getting a chance for, for, for two people who disagree to see each other's humanity. And maybe from that, um, some, some good things will happen. I, I will just say, in this legal practice that I do, representing people in the criminal legal system, I have gotten people who I completely disagree with politically, completely, to embrace criminal legal system reform that we are involved in because we sat and had conversations and I didn't write them off, they didn't write me off. And I would like to underline what David just said. And I think when you're, when you're confronted with someone whose views are completely polar opposite of what you think, um, it's very easy to dismiss them as an idiot. But I think if you have a conversation and struggle to find some point of agreement, 
that that is a place where you can start building change. I mean, you may not ever get someone to agree that systemic racism is a problem, but maybe they would agree that what happened to George Floyd was a problem. And maybe we need to now figure out policies that could prevent that from happening. And so it may not be the big change you're looking for, but baby steps still count as change. And, and I agree with him, the more we can have these conversations, perhaps the less polarized we will be and the more focused we'll be on, on creating some positive change as opposed to just shouting loudly or trying to convince someone like everything I believe is right and everything you believe is wrong. So, so if I could add just one thing to both what David and Valerie said, I also think we have to remember as an institution of higher education, you know, we do have a duty to, to educate. And so our students are leaning on us to prepare for them to go out into the workforce, to go out into the community. And so those opportunities to engage, when there's a conversation about an issue we may not agree on, that may be the only time that student interacts with someone with a different perspective than them. And I think we have an obligation to make sure we, that we engage their students because when they go out into the workforce, we wanna make sure they're exposed to as many different perspectives and as many different ideas and thought processes as possible. And if we don't take advantage of those opportunities, we're gonna be doing them a huge disservice. So I think if we look at them as individuals coming with unique perspectives, and this is an opportunity for us to at least expose them to something as two tips we can use, that'll help us in a lot of these conversations. Great. Um, there is a question, a couple of questions are about voting um, and civic duties and responsibilities. Um, and there is a thought that uh, higher ed may not be preparing the students well enough in those areas to know the significance of it or what it means. What do, what do you all think about, again, higher ed's role in preparing that and where would students get that in their matriculation through a university? Well, let me, let me just say this, it, it is not, it should not all, fall fall on higher education. Um, when I was in elementary school, that's when I learned about the importance of voting. I remember watching, what was it, um, that show on ABC on Saturday mornings or a school, a Schoolhouse Rocks, I think, or something, I think, I think that's what it's called. My memory is, is foggy because I'm old now, but, um, you know, I remember learning about how a bill gets passed and, and, and things of that nature. We talked about that in my elementary school and, and, and in middle school. And I recognize I got the benefit of a good public school education growing up where I, where I, was, um, where I was raised. Not everybody gets that, but I think that's even less the case now. Um, you, you know, I, 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 I talked to folks um, who are saying, well, the reason I'm voting for this candidate for president is because the day the day they get in office, they're gonna make reparations for black people happen. I'm like, well, wait a minute. The, the president doesn't get to just do everything that the president wants to do. There's a Congress and this is how things happen. Lots of people have no idea. Um, so I don't know if I have the answer to what higher ed should be doing. Um, I, I, I do think that we should recognize that there is a deficit um, that many of our students are coming to us with in terms of never being educated on civics, um, the importance of being engaged. And wherever I can in the classes that I teach, I find ways to work in the importance of voting. I, I almost always talk about that in some way, shape or form because it, it matters, it really matters. Benita, if I could jump in, you know, I think that David makes some excellent points. You know, when you think about some K-12 systems are talking about this, but as he mentioned, many of our students are coming with zero exposure to that. And so I think we have a duty as a higher education institution to find out ways to connect with our students on important issues or issues that we think important. I think it's unanimous in this panel and unanimous across campus that voting is important. And so I think we've got to start thinking about how can we plan, you know, how can we plan co-curricular programs around these issues. You know, we're not pushing one agenda versus another. We just want individuals to be engaged and be civically engaged. And part of that falls on us to make sure that as we're going through the year, as our student affairs professionals are thinking about what are the things that we want to connect our students with, it should be around these issues. Because again, if someone goes to their K-12 system and their higher education system, 
and they've never been connected to the idea of voting is important and why it's important, then the educational system has done them to some extent a disservice. And so uh, being a student ready institution, we've got to make sure that we pick up the gaps and meet students where they are. And if we think that's a gap, we've got to be intentional on in how we fill that void. Very good. And this is the last question. Um, there's a lot going on. A lot of them seem like daunting tasks and challenges. What are you all finding that's inspiring or what gives you hope coming out of this? Both of these, the pandemic and the, and the racism issue. I think one thing that gives me hope, um, maybe the word hope is overblown because I, I, I've been through so many cycles of this, but at least what I see with the current protests is that they are definitely multiracial. And so the racism, the challenge of racism in our country is no longer something that black Americans have to carry on their shoulders alone. But I think for the very first time since really the 1960s, early 70s, have I seen this many white people engaged in trying at least to draw attention to these challenges. And that gives me hope because you're gonna, it's gonna take the majority of citizens of this country to create systemic change. And so we need to have the majority strongly engaged. I would add to Valerie's point, which is um, also what's given me hope, it's multi-generational too. Uh, seeing Gen Z more active on, on the streets in protests, but also on social media, even TikTok and all other <laughs> uh, social media venues, but being active, this is, gives me a lot of hope about the future. In, in addition to all of those things, um, seeing police officers take a knee with protesters that's something we've never seen before in any movement. Um, the police have always drawn the thin blue line. They're there with their SWAT gear and you have some individuals um, taking it and, and identifying with the protesters. And to me, that's phenomenal. I think that the fact that, the, that majorities of people across um, racial, gender, and generational lines support Black Lives Matter is inspirational to me. Um, that I, I I I take hope in that I really do, um, and it, it, and I, I hope more and more people will come to understand that Black Lives Matter is not about saying that only Black Lives Matter, but that for too long in this country, Black people's lives have not mattered, and that they matter also. And I think that the tragedy of what happened in those eight minutes and 46 seconds when the life was squeezed out of George Floyd has woken up a lot of people to the fact that black lives have not mattered. Uh, for me, you know, what I see hope or inspiration is the fact that I think now in all of our institutions in the country, individuals are recognizing that, that black people have a different experience. And so one of the things that's been really unique and exciting is that we're seeing a lot of our, you know, white brothers and sisters reaching out asking how you're doing. And we've been dealing with these things for as long as we can all remember, but never before in the past. So I think we've seen uniformly how individuals are saying, how are you? Are you doing okay? And how can I help? I think that's a huge step and a step that we have not seen in the past. So when I think about um, how inspiring it is, the fact that we've got other individuals who are really concerned with, with our well-being is, is really exciting and really encouraging. Daryl, it's back to you. Thank you, Benita. So ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to closure here. And um, I wanna first thank our panelists. And, but I also wanna thank Vice President Benita Brown for pulling us all together today for the town hall. Um, what many of you may not know, this is the first of, of many that will happen during this academic school year and moving forward. And so we're really excited to have opportunities like this. Having these conversations are an essential part of healing and growth. And today our panelists touched on so many topics and gave us incredible guidance and information. And although these are difficult times, um, as we've seen um, lately, there's also been an outpouring of love and support across the races. And it's been very important. And I appreciate you know, what Andy shared just now, because it's very true. Um, when people call and say, how are you? And, and, and show their caring. 
So today, we, as we close, we realize that NKU is a small representation of the nation and that we're going to have different views and different opinions. And it's our diversity of views that what makes us strong and what makes us great. I'm proud to be a part of what we're building here at Northern Kentucky University. And yes, we have much work remaining at our university and across the country as we work toward a more equitable society. But let's remember to celebrate the victories along the way. Our community will engage in more of these conversations like I shared. And in the future, they will also include students. We will hear their voices as well. So with that, thank you for, for coming with us. And we appreciate you engaging with us today and have a wonderful weekend.